So uh, let's get started again. I just want to kind of give a quick uh, background on who you are and, and what you guys do for anybody that's not familiar with you. And, um, and then we'll start in with the topic that we want to talk about today. So I'm Ben Monsma, work for Louisville Spray Foam, uh, one of the lead estimators, project coordinators, a uh, little bit of do it all since we're a small local company. Um, really try to focus on best bang for the buck while considering high efficiency building, high performance building. So All right. that's a quick gist. And for those who don't know me, I'm Eric George with Building Performance. We do home energy ratings for new construction as well as energy audits and diagnostic testing on existing homes. So we work with, uh, we work with Ben a lot as well as other insulation contractors, heating, cooling contractors, uh, builders and remodelers. Uh, pretty much within about an hour, hour and a half radius around Louisville. And a lot of things that we get called in for are, uh, you know, trying to figure out why, you know, buildings have either high utility bills or comfort problems, indoor air quality issues, things like that. And Ben gets a lot of those same kind of calls. And so uh, we were talking about a week or so ago about doing this and uh, basically kind of educating people who aren't really familiar with spray foam insulation, um, some of the pros and cons to look out for. So a lot of people think that, you know, installing spray foam is going to be kind of a silver bullet to fix their, their problem, whatever it may be. They, you know, they think just squirting that foam in and their, their problems are going to go away. Um, sometimes that may be true, but I've found that a lot of times if it's not installed properly or if people aren't thinking about things uh, other things, other uh, considerations in advance, it can actually cause some other problems that were not foreseen. So um, I think you have a, a few things that you wanted to touch on uh, and I'll just let you talk real quick here. Yeah, that's a pretty perfect segue into some of the issues we can get into. Um, I talked about it a couple of weeks ago with the spray foam industry um, on one of their pages about the concept that a house needs to breathe. A building needs to breathe. Um, I don't shy away from using that terminology like a lot of performance builders do, um, but it just depends where it's breathing, whether it's uncontrolled with the outside air or in high performance building, you know, we like to have it controlled through the mechanical system so that you can actually condition that air really well. So to that point about, you know, buildings breathing, a lot of people think that, you know, buildings have to breathe and, um, you know, uh, houses don't necessarily have lungs. They, they're not necessarily, you know, what, what do you think people mean when they say that buildings have to breathe? I think they really start by meaning they need to breathe like living things need to breathe. Um, so you keep that familiar idea of a uh, house needs to breathe, but remind them that the breathing is for typically moisture management right. and indoor air quality is the deeper part of that. Right. So the number one reason around the country for major renovation issues is because of moisture infiltration and water problems. Yeah. So what are some of the problems that you have seen where um, water is getting into the house either through, you know, infiltration through air leakage or through uh, improper flashing or whatever? I mean, what, what are you kind of seeing out there? Well, condensation on interior walls is one of the crazier ones. We dealt with that a lot in the spring. And you, you, you know one of, specifically I'm talking about from last year. It was crazy. Um, they were wanting to keep the house at, what, 68 degrees. And so you were getting condensation on an interior wall because of humid air infiltration through the attic. So in addition to that, I mean, you know, I've, I've been getting a lot of calls for uh, ductwork that sweats. And I think you just referred me to one that I did uh, a couple of days ago where there was ductwork sweating in the basement and, and it hadn't necessarily been an issue in the past, but um, people are, are all of a sudden with the last couple of years has been really hot, humid weather and been uh, raining a ton, at least in our area for the last couple of years. And so these kind of new problems are, are sprouting up and people that have 
taken steps to spray foam their house or air seal and insulate their house in one form or another are basically seeing things that they didn't see before. Um, and so I guess, you know, maybe you can talk a little bit to that. Well, and part of what you're alluding to and what with that specific project, what kind of my thought process was knowing you, your process building performance was the pressure boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, where is that air getting in and why? Um, because you and I both know in a perfect world, we can control that, but existing homes that are, you know, 40 years old, sometimes even brand new homes, that air isn't controlled. So it's coming in through between the first floor and the foundation through the band board and uh, rim joists. And then the first thing that humid air is hitting is a very cold HVAC, you know, ductwork pipe that by right. code doesn't have to be insulated. So, right, because it's air in hits it. space. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you can uh, you got to watch some of those things. Um, like in this one, I mean, the house was built long ago enough they weren't even thinking about it. I don't, you know, and so our environment around us is changing. Yeah. Um, however you want to say that. I mean, we had more rain in the beginning of our year than we've ever had. And that's different for the Ohio Valley. Yeah. So um, what are, what are some of the other issues that you've seen on calls um, lately pertaining to, you know, spray foam, either not being installed correctly because of, um, you know, maybe the installer didn't mix it properly or there was temperature issues or, or what have you. Yeah. Um, we had one where it, the foam was good. It was safe. Um, the application of it was against a wet roof deck. Mm -hmm. So the shingles went on. It was closed cell spray foam which is not preferred against a roof deck in our area, but it's not, it's not a no, no. Um, right. But you really have to watch the moisture content in the wood. And in this case, that OSB, you know, started to swell and buckle and you could see it, you know, in the shingles from the outside, it was just a big wave, you know, like the bottom of the lake or the ocean. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it's not a it's not a fun conversation when the two options are tear the roof off or dig out six inches of closed cell spray foam, which is probably more work. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say impossible, but it's not fun. Yeah. Um, and if people would slow down a little bit, I mean, this isn't just picking on a few people. It's not grandpa's insulation. I mean, you can't just throw it up there and forget it. Yeah. Um, we got to remember, you know, if that wood is too wet, spray foam doesn't mix. Um, or if it's but too at the cold. same, yeah, I mean, that that's a little less of an issue. We have to take a lot of precautions around that, make sure we're not hitting dew points and it's science. Um, yeah. But at the same point, with some of those older buildings that just have the clapboard siding, you want closed cell to yeah. keep that humidity out. Because there's no so, real air barrier there for the house, for the air to stop from coming into the wall cavities. Yeah, no house wrap of any sort or anything like that. It's just, it was wood. They didn't really think about building science back in the day, and there, there wasn't really such a term until probably the last 20 or 30 years. Um, well, and... It was never a problem, in, in my opinion, like if I were to write, you know, about old houses in the unintended building science, you know, through a Victorian house, you know, that sacrificial third floor before HVAC was around, you know, you get the stack effect, you get the air moving up through the wall behind the plaster mm -hmm. from a cold cellar to a hot attic space. And you actually get a cooling effect that way. Yeah. But now we're, now we're paying for that air and it hurts you know, so, when you just lose it uncontrollably. Yep. What's up, Dick Breeland just joined us. What's up, Ian Hooper? Um, 
So kind of to that point, and I'm going to plug in my phone real quick here before I lose my, my video signal. Um, so I see a lot of houses around Louisville that are built before 1940 that uh, have what's called balloon framing. And so basically that means that most often there's, there's not a top plate to kind of separate the wall from the attic space above it. And sometimes there's not a bottom plate either. Um, what, you know, and I'm sure you get calls for houses like that. What do you typically do in a situation where the homeowner says, well, my, my walls are freezing cold in the wintertime, you know, a house is built, you know, 30s or 40s or whatever. What, what can you do or what do you recommend that you do for those situations? So before with a balloon frame house, before you can do anything else, you got to block the bottom of that wall section. Okay. Um, the goal being is if they don't want to open up the wall from the inside of the house or the outside of the house would be to do a drill and fill process, um, preferably with cellulose. So if that, if that house to that point though, if that house had just original wood siding on it and there was no real air barrier to it, do you, and, and it hasn't been covered with vinyl siding or, or something since then, you know, do you still recommend insulating the walls at all? Or are there some other places that might be a better bang for their buck, something that's not going to potentially create a, uh, an issue where, you know, what I've seen is that these older houses, a lot of times the windows were never really flashed in any kind of way. Right. So yeah. If water gets into the exterior wall cavity and there's no insulation in the wall, well, there's air moving through that wall and so it can dry out. The wood can dry out. But if you start putting insulation into those wall cavities, then you start getting, um, it just stays in the wall cavity. It can't dry out. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know how you guys approach it. I'm going to plug my phone in real quick. Yeah. It's a, Eric, that's a serious challenge um, because then we're balancing and what I feel most insulation companies do not do is act as a consultant. Um, we have to be aware of a lot of those situations, and especially with spray foam, so we're not causing further problems. Right. Um, preference, you know, kind of the shorthand in my mind is to follow the ABCs. So you do your attic, your uh, basement, band boards crawl space, then conditioning, doors and windows, and then towards the bottom there, actually the walls, because yes, they play a big effect, but they carry the least bang for the buck because you have to be so intrusive to do them right. Right. So you kind of talked about, you touched on stack effect earlier. Um, and stack effect, for those people that don't know, is basically when warm air rises up out of a building, the taller that building is, the more drive you have of that warm air rising up through the top. So not only do you have air leakage that leaks out the top of the building, but it's also drawn in through the bottom of the building, wherever you have holes and gaps and things between the foundation and the rim and band joist. If there's gas lines, plumbing lines, electrical lines that are coming in, air gets drawn in through the bottom. So uh, you especially see this on buildings that are like two, three stories and, and taller. Um, so, you know, with stack effect, the, your ABC method there, basically, if you seal the top of the house first, you're going to stop the leakage at the top, but it, there's still going to be a little bit of a draw at the bottom. So you seal the top, you seal the bottom, and that should stop the majority of the air leakage in the house. Um, you know, a lot of people, it, when I first got into the insulation industry, we're talking about uh, drilling and filling wall cavities, and that was going to make their house so much more efficient and, and all this and that. And I think uh, we've learned over time that that's not necessarily the biggest bang for the buck. So, um, so what else, what, else, what other kind of things are you seeing out there? Well, so if you just go by, you know, the A and B do the easy stuff, easy to get to attic and band boards. Uh, you have to watch the pressure boundary. Um, so like my mom's house, not such a big deal because her house is now positively pressurized. So any moisture is, you know, moving out right. at those windows. Um, she calls me every winter. I have frost on the inside of my storm window. Shocker. Okay. Surprise, surprise. Um, she's keeping a healthy amount of humidity all through the winter, which is really nice. Mm -hmm. um, but she calls me every winter. I have frost on my windows. And wear on the windows is a big part of the equation. 
if it's on the inside of the window, like you can swipe your finger on it and frost comes off, you have much bigger problems. Yeah. Because uh, then you've negatively pressurized your house and you're drawing in moisture. Um, you just got to have, you have to account for that. Uh, fresh air systems, ERVs, HRVs, it, you know, dehumidification, variable speed. There's so many different ways to do it. Um, that's where like you come in as you know, you can consult with them. You can tell them it's this pressure or, you know, this is the best way for your situation to handle it. So to that point, I mean, you know, my house was built about 12 years ago and it's a production built house, but we actually had the, the roof line was spray foamed. I spray foamed the band joists and everything else. And it's, you know, it's a relatively tight house, but compared to new, new construction standards, it's still not where, you know, I would like it to be. But my house every winter, the third floor windows will get condensation on them. And that's really because, you know, there's, there's a lot more warm, moist air inside the house that's touching a piece of glass or, um, you know, the, the vinyl surrounding of the frame that is below what's called the dew point. So if it's, if it's 20 or 30 degrees outside, you can guarantee that that window is going to be at what's called a dew point temperature. And, um, and it's really hard to stop unless you either reduce the relative humidity inside your house to the point where that dew point temperature uh, isn't, you know, causing those many, that many problems. But, um, you know, these are and all you're not comfortable. And then you may not be comfortable. So th there's always this kind of delicate balance in, of making the homeowner comfortable and also making the, the house work properly. So we do yeah. have a question from somebody you might, uh, might know there. Matt Gillies is asking about, uh, <laughs> he's like, you know, what about, what about uh, you know, in installing open cell foam in crawl spaces or just putting one inch of closed cell foam in crawl spaces? Um, yeah. Yeah. Um. So anybody who knows spray foam should know the history of Isonine. Uh, they're a Canadian company, started as a Canadian company, and now have merged with a Texas company. Um, they only had an open cell spray foam. And they were preaching that you can do a water permeable open cell spray foam in a crawl space. And it had an asterisk next to it. <laughs> Whenever you see that asterisk, get ready for a big read. Um, so they were talking about you had to have active air movement, active dehumidification. In essence, you're treating it like a wet-blown cellulose or wet-blown you know, fiberglass that all of us have probably seen in crawl spaces. Um, it gets wet. You got to make sure it dries out. Right. Not... But in the perfect world, who, who is educating that customer to understand that's the actual thing going on um, and how much is that going to cost them down the line? So it's mm -hmm. in, in our opinion, um, it's not, it's the rarity. It should always be the most rare thing to do open cell in a crawl space. Yeah, the other thing I would say about open cell, and, and I see it a lot. What's up, Tamara? She just joined us. And uh, don't worry, Ian, uh, we are recording this, so you will get to see the whole video later if you'd like to. Um, you know, the open cell foam doesn't really seal to the vapor barrier uh, that's put down in crawl spaces very well. It yep. may initially seal. And what I'm saying, so for people that don't know, if you have a crawl space under your house, we're not talking about what's up above you. We're talking about what, what's below the floor. So over the ground, you should have a plastic vapor barrier to prevent any ground moisture from evaporating up into the house. And if you decide to spray foam the crawl space, they're going to do uh, the interior of those foundation walls and the rim joist, and they're going to seal that spray foam down onto the plastic that's installed. But it may initially seal, but what I've seen um, after a short period of time is it will pull away and then you don't really have a tight, uh, a tight vapor barrier um, between the foundation walls and the plastic. Uh, thanks for joining us, Tim Winters and Pamela Wes. Uh, yeah, crawl spaces are a challenge. <laughs> I mean, 
we did that until we knew better. Um, you know, you have to get a really serious overlap of spray foam and plastic. Um, the, you know, we stopped spray foaming a lot of our seams. Now, we do it with closed cell because it sticks much better. Mm -hmm. um, but even just a properly made, you know, vapor barrier tape, um, like, comes to mind, the Viper system mm -hmm. is a, you know, class A vapor barrier. So it's not the plastic you're buying from Home Depot or Lowe's. Right. So, you know, there are differences mm -hmm. like that. Again, open cell in a crawl space, just no, please don't. Um, now, the one caveat that you and I have talked about a lot is open cell on the band board of a crawl space. Right. To let the sill plate potentially dry out if it gets wet. And so um, I, I just had another question while you're talking about that. The other day, um, I was talking with a homeowner who had a really wet crawl space. And I said, first of all, before you even think about foaming this crawl space, you need to make sure that you don't have water coming into the crawl space yeah. either from the ground around the house or there's a plumbing leak or whatever. So the first time I was at the house, there was no water in the crawl space. It was bone dry, but I could tell by looking at the top of the plastic that it had water at one point in time. So I said, look, um, the outside of your house doesn't look like there's good grading where the, the ground kind of slopes away from the house. So whenever it rains, if it's like this, it's going to go into the crawl space. So that's something that you have to fix first. The other thing that you want to look at is if you have downspouts from your gutters that are basically just dumping water right next to the perimeter instead of extending away from the house first, that's something else you need to consider. So, um, but she was thinking about doing her crawl space and, and, and foaming it. And she said, Hey, um, you know, I get the, uh, the termite inspection done like once a year. And um, they said that I can't seal over the, the foundation where it connects to the rim and band joist. And what do you think about that? <laughs> uh, it's a huge point of contention. Uh, a couple big <clears throat> pest companies are running around the country. Uh, they now do insulation. They do fiberglass work. And they are saying uh, you should not spray foam. Uh, it's causing a huge issue. Uh, to which if you ask them, what is the problem with spray foam? Well, we can't see where the termite tunnels are. Okay, if you're going to seal that with fiberglass, vinyl draped fiberglass, how are you going to see where the termite tunnels are? Right. You, know, it's, you, you run into a little bit of the same issue. It's a fair point uh, that I don't want to just like poo-poo on. But one of the things that we as an industry have started talking nationwide about doing is leaving a termite inspection strip. So cover the sill plate, but down on the wall, you know, leave a four inch gap, uh, sacrificial piece. So we're not causing problems with our termite folks. If you get into a good conversation with the termite folks, they will say, the best system to use is the in-ground bait system from the outside anyway. Okay. Um, which then you're tracking, when you go into a crawl space, you're tracking rotten wood. Again, termites, from my understanding, I'm not a termite pro, but Neither I have to know, I, we have to know about it because we come across it so much. Um, yeah. They're attracted to wet wood. The biggest thing, like you said, is keep the water, the bulk water, away. Away from the house. Grass, gutters, grade. Three Gs make it real simple. And that'll handle almost all your water issues. And that's, talking about Matt, like, we've been talking about that for years. Yeah. Like, we are not a waterproofing company. Uh, Closed cell spray foam is a great moisture barrier. But bulk water will carve the Grand Canyon. Yeah. <laughs> it'll, it'll cause a lot of problems. But once you stop that bulk water pressure, um, it helps a lot. And then in other, you know, you've seen the, uh, yeah, what, the TRP board, the vinyl board, mm -hmm. that like uh, 
waterproofing companies do where they basically chisel out a little bit of concrete and just redirect the water into a drain system. Yep. Um, I did that for my house down in Shelby Park with the brick. So I knew it wasn't going to stick. It wasn't going to stay. But the water now gets redirected into my drain system. So um, <clears throat> these are all great points that we're bringing up. And a lot of people probably have never thought about these different issues, um, you know, how to address them or whatever. Um, I want to throw out a couple other things and, um, you know, that, that we get a lot of calls for to try to figure out. One of the biggest ones that we get calls for, and I'm sure you do as well, is the room above the garage, otherwise known as the bonus room. So why is this room so hot? Why, why can't this room be comfortable? Um, and I think there's a, there's a couple of reasons why um, it's so hot, namely because you're basically putting a room that is surrounded by attic on three sides and a garage below it. So instead of your house where you've got just an attic above you, that particular room has attic on the front and the back side as well as above and that attic temperature is usually 120 to 140 degrees in the summertime so uh, if it's not insulated properly which it hardly ever is um, it's just going to have all that heat radiating and baking that room and a lot of heating and cooling contractors they don't um, they don't put enough air going into or pull enough air coming out of those rooms but the first line of defense really is the insulation. And, and um, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you guys approach that. Um, the biggest thing, again, is going back to your ABCs. You know, you're just in a much, much more compact space with a bonus room above the garage. I've also referred to them as frog rooms, family rooms over garage. Um, I thought that was related to, like, it's always hot and humid, like frog swamp. Uh, I got corrected on that one. <laughs> but you start with what you can get to um, in any bit of roof line that you can get to and stop the shingle heat from coming in. Um, so if we can't get over the garage, mm. or excuse me, if we can't get over that room because of the vaulted ceilings, uh, we'll go in behind the knee walls and install baffles to continue the airflow and moisture management and then spray foam uh, against that roof line. So those knee walls that for people that don't understand, so those knee walls are the short three or four foot, five foot tall walls that face the attic spaces. And those typically what I see in a lot of older houses, they just have a piece of, uh, you know, the Pink Panther fiberglass that's installed in there and there's nothing behind it. There's no plywood, there's no foam board, there's nothing to stop the air from kind of moving through that insulation. And a, and a big point that I want people to understand is that, you know, one of the biggest differences between spray foam and fiberglass or even cellulose insulation is that when air moves through fiberglass, it reduces its effectiveness big time. So if you have a piece of fiberglass in a wall cavity that's facing an attic, and it has nothing to stop that hot, humid air from moving through it, it's darn near worthless. Um, whereas when spray foam's installed, it basically is an air barrier at a certain thickness. And so it'll stop that air and it'll perform at the actual um, R value that it's intended to. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about how thick the spray foam should be to work properly for these different kinds real quick. So again, we can't just, you know, downplay our values. Our values do matter at a certain point. Um, so that, that's one part, but we, so we look at the temperature differentials and where it makes the most sense to use spray foam. Mm -hmm. uh, so like those knee walls, when you have the wall here and the roof line coming this way, in that space, you're still building up a ton of heat. I right. mean, that's an uncontrolled attic space. It's going to get, you know, 130 degrees. R13 right. of whatever material probably isn't going to stop that. Right. You know, so in our perspective, it's best to try to keep it out all the, altogether. Um, and, you know, in the case of needing to ventilate, that is redirecting that airflow, but still keeping the heat out. 
So in spray foam, um, the performance path, and this is what a lot of people don't understand, there's the prescriptive path of the building code and energy codes, and then the performance path. And you, of course, you know this, but uh, we are noticing when properly done and intelligently placed, you know, five to six inches of spray foam will outperform an R38 of fiberglass. Yeah, I guess so, part of the, yeah. what you're saying, though, so if you have a if you have a bonus room that's like this, it's got the vaulted ceilings above the garage, rather than insulate the, the walls here. If you insulate the vaulted ceiling, the underside of that roof deck, and it comes down all the way to basically the other side of the floor, now those little attic spaces behind those walls are not 120, 130 degrees. Correct. So they're basically the same temperature as the inside of your house, and you don't have this heat that's just baking into that room. Yep. So we do have a question from Tamara. And she says uh, she has a 50-year-old Bedford Stone house. Uh, is it more economic to spray foam the walls and the attic or rip off the plaster and put the batting in the walls and then re-drywall? Um, I'm going to tell you that that's going to be a huge waste of your money to remove all the plaster from your walls just to try to insulate the, uh, the walls. Um, yeah. If you have a ranch that's like that, probably your best bet is to look for any uh, penetrations that you have going through the ceiling to seal up. So like recessed lights are a big thing. If you have a bunch of recessed lights in your house and they're not what's called uh, airtight can lights, they lose heat and air constantly. Um, electrical penetrations that go through walls, uh, even ductwork that's up in an attic. So what I usually tell people, and that's, and I actually just came from a house that was just like this. Um, and the guy had remodeled his house and installed probably a hundred recessed lights in the house, but some of them were older recessed lights and some were the new junction box type of LED, kind of the flat lights. And the ones that were the older can lights, he put the LED retrofit kits into those cans, but he was still getting a lot of uh, issues with breathing, um, his sinuses and throat. And actually, my throat's raspy right now because I used the blower door to pull all the air into the house to see and prove that this was happening. But, um, yeah, so the dusty mess. what I'm saying is if, if you air seal the ceiling first, any of these holes that go through the ceiling, including any attic hatches, uh, things like that, and then you add insulation over top of that, it's going to be a lot more cost effective and probably uh, give you a better uh, improvement on comfort than, you know, trying to insulate the walls, the exterior walls of your house. Potentially. And we got to watch, you know, because a lot of people think, um, hey, if I just put more and more and more insulation on that floor, even after air sealing, uh, doesn't always solve the issue. Um, so we've done a, a with you a couple of times the hybrid systems where we'll use the spray foam to do the air sealing go get all the hard sparts hard parts excuse me where fiberglass or cellulose just don't work because of how the house was built right. i mean so we're talking about the junction at the wall um you need 12 inches of cellulose or 14 to 16 inches of fiberglass to even start to do a good job. Mm -hmm. You're not going to get it in a, you know, older Bedford stone house. Um, cause that you cause might you have, have you've got yeah. tiny little space right there. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's one of those things. Um, Matt Reisinger just did a good video with Ken Allison about retrofit, uh, without going full blown spray foam which I like. I like people problem solving outside the box. Um, so they vacuumed out the existing insulation. They air sealed the perimeter with spray foam. A huge, huge part of getting a well-controlled attic is making sure you have enough uh, ventilation. Mm -hmm. So at the soffit at the bottom and at the box vents or continuous ridge vent at the top, um, if that's not balanced either the air doesn't get out and you're just putting an oven above your house right. or worse, 
Uh, it's sucking the air and you're causing the stack effect and you're sucking air you pay for out of your house. Right. So, so that air sealing part is, is a big challenge. And then to do it efficiently uh, and affordably is another so consideration. The house that I was just in was just like that, where it didn't have any soffit ventilation. It just had gaps between the wood, you know, roof is like this. <laughs> you know, yeah. barely overhanging the outside. And you could see a little bit of daylight between that connection, but there was a ridge vent at the top and hardly any ventilation at the bottom. And so basically air from the house was kind of being drawn up. But the funny thing was um, he was having more of an issue at nighttime once it got cooler. And I think it was because that, you know, the, the, the temperature and the humidity inside the attic was cooling down and that colder air is falling down through these, these holes and these gaps and things that are around the recess lights and the attic access and, and all these other things. So um, these are kind of things that you got to think about when you're hiring a spray foam company and, and whether you're going to install spray foam or cellulose or fiberglass, there's, they really need to understand how the house performs as a whole and, and what kind of repercussions you could have. Uh, another example that I've seen is, um, you know, there's there's no exhaust ventilation from the bathrooms that actually goes out of the attic it just kind of dumps air into the attic and then they want to foam the roof deck well if you don't run those exhaust fans outside of the attic before you spray foam the attic all you're going to do is just dump more moisture up into the attic and then eventually you're going to start growing things in your attic that you don't want <laughs> yeah that's really i would qualify that under as bad form um you know, just fundamentals of spray foam is make sure uh, you're not getting spray foam against combustible materials, you know, so the furnace vent pipe, chimneys, things like that, that bathroom fans are vented completely to the outside. Right. Um, Before the foam. You know, yeah, or during, yeah. Um, we carry the ventilation pipes on our spray foam trucks. Um because during an inspection, you know, it's not uncommon to find that a bathroom fan was completely covered with fiberglass or cellulose and was just not going anywhere. Right. So we're not going to leave, you know, and not do our job. We're going to solve the problem. Right. And you run it to a, run it to a box vent, you know, run it to the closest box vent you can find um, and get it out of the house. Right. So we're kind of running out of uh, time here. We actually cool. went a little bit longer than I was expecting, but once we start talking, I know we always kind of keep going and there's lots of things to talk about and I'll definitely have you back on here again, but yeah, um, just want to kind of close it out. Um, how can we get in contact with you or how can the viewers get in contact with you? So Louisville Insulation is host to Louisville Spray Foam. Uh, our cell or phone number is 502 377 zero zero seven eight and that'll get you to casey in the office um where we can come out do a consult do some problem solving uh eric you and i have been working together for almost 10 years now yep. um, yeah so there's a lot of information i have naturally but a lot of things you have the tools to test for just to make sure that we're set up right right so, uh, you know, it's, I think you meant LouisvilleInsulation.com is the website, right? Yes, um, LouisvilleInsulation.com is the website. And uh, so my company is BuildingPerformanceGroup.com. You can reach us at 502-509-5535. And, uh, we, you know, we love to work with insulation contractors like Ben and other people and other HVAC contractors, builders, remodelers who, who really want to do a good job. And if you're a homeowner who is not working with one of us or your builder's not using somebody that's, that's using a third party uh, to inspect the insulation installer or to actually test and verify that these, these applications are being installed properly, you know, uh, to be honest, we don't cost that much money. And, and compared to, you know, ripping out drywall or the mold that may form and the remediation that may happen, um, I think it's a, it's a good, you know, I'm a little biased here, but you're spending your money wisely by having somebody like us come in and, and inspect and just make sure that, um, you know, cause everybody, there's problems, you know, people, even with best intentions, they miss things. And uh, the, the main point is that you want to get it right. And you want to hire a contractor who's willing to, 
own up to it and make it right if it does happen. So, and those post project audits that you do, like with us, they're mm -hmm. fun. Yeah. Uh, you figure out where your strengths are and where you need to touch it up and always more information just makes you better company, better people. And if you're doing an existing home and you do an air leakage test before the work starts and then after the work starts, you can actually quantify and see what kind of a, an improvement that you made. So I really yep. appreciate you being on with me today and I'll definitely Thank have you. you on again. And Let's uh, do it again. Um, now, yeah, appreciate it, man. Have a all good right. Day. Be good. You all have a great day. See ya. Bye.